Now, the ATRA recommends four reforms. Uh -huh. Establishing a liability trigger that reflects the intentional tort origins and quasi-criminal nature of punitive damages awards the actual malice. So, mm -hmm. Now, there's a possibility of actual malice on the part of each and every sheriff's department. Yes. For refusing to enforce kidnapping laws, and then there's the requiring the clear and convincing evidence mm -hmm. to establish punitive damages liability. So, you know, after 2,270,000 emails to every sheriff and every judge of, of Washington State, yes, and numerous sheriff's, uh, sheriff's departments in different counties through each and every state of the United States, and then mm, state troopers, too. Uh, and uh, police departments in other cities, mm -hmm. let's say um, it didn't require a jury, because I just found out about summary judgments, and I'll explain how they work. Yes. Let's say I just motion the court with a summary judgment, yes, of the clear and convincing evidence that you have knowledge of fraud, misrepresentation, forgery, child abduction, child neglect, uh, child exploitation, and uh, kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it establishes the punitive damages liabilities for each and every county sheriff that has knowledge of this. Mm -hmm. Now you'd say, well, he's wrong. Yeah, he's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I need to learn from my mistakes. Pooch. But I've been emailing ri.pdf to pretty much every email. Mm -hmm. I mean, of the 2,260,000 of them. Yes. Um probably two million a hundred thousand of them got it mm -hmm. now ri.pdf is a very clear copy of this yes where it says the respondent did not receive actual notice of the hearing and mm -hmm. there was no personal service service by mail or service by publication yeah and um, the sheriff's department said well it didn't happen in our jurisdiction too <laughs> punitive damages I'm gonna teach you a lesson there sheriffs ooch well if you don't receive actual notice of the hearing, uh, why would you go to the hearing if you didn't get the actual notice? Uh -huh. Now, the this order is issued in accord with the full faith and credit provisions of the AWA. Yeah, it actually wasn't. Without any notice of court hearings, I was not given a reasonable notice. And without reasonable notice, I wasn't given the opportunity to be heard. Ouch. That's what the actual RI.PDF says. Ooh. Oh, oh. Now, let's say that you had me arrested on a half a million dollar bail bond, Judge Landis. Thought it was excessive. <laughs> but this case number is actually a district court case. It's not an actual case number from law enforcement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wrong warrant for my arrest. But each and every sheriff says, well, it's not in our jurisdiction. We don't have to do anything. <laughs> And then you have me arrested for failing for uh, to appear for a criminal complaint. Yes, two of them. Yes, without any signed statement of any citizen witness because I was never arrested and my rights were never read to me. <laughs> then you have me evaluated at my expense because it's to be determined how much I'm going to pay for the public defender that you assigned to me. <laughs> when you didn't give me summons of court hearings and then they... Public defender decided to have a little personal meeting with uh, Jack Range. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, he's not a gay man who was tortured and killed because of his sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. I thought the Matthew Shepard law was a mandatory 10 years in prison for uh, the color of law violation of refusing to hear somebody when they're telling law enforcement about torture, torment, and uh, harassment. Yes. Now... I don't think you have to be homosexual for it to uh, be applicable in every sheriff's department of the United States. <laughs> See, I think Jack got it wrong, and I would never tell my public defender that he's wrong because he's always right. But my personal experience is it wasn't. It had nothing to do with sexual orientation. Matthew Shepard had reached out to law enforcement about the harassment that he was experiencing, <laughs> the malice. Yeah. The torment and torture and eventually had him killed. Now, the lack of his wife's signature on the protection order, yes, and his insistence that the Violence Against Women's Act was being violated are not germane to his case. 
Without a signature of the petitioner, there's no guarantee she appeared in court. And if she didn't appear in court, there's no liability for, uh, to the petitioner. That means there's no jurisdiction of the petitioner. That means the state of Washington took it upon themselves to issue a court order where I've been arrested. Yes, I've been imprisoned for multiple false uh, reports. Yes, and it had very little to do with my sexual orientation. It had a lot to do with harassment. Yes. Now, uh, wants to present these beliefs in a way to show he is the victim of being harassed and the courts are in the wrong. <laughs> There's no possible way the court could be in the wrong, not requiring the signature of the petitioner. Yes. There's no possible way the court could be wrong in using a forgery. Nope. There's no possible way the court could be wrong in not giving me notice of court hearings. Yes. There's no possible way the court could be wrong in giving custody of my sons mm -hmm, to my wife without her acknowledging receipt of the custody order. <laughs> there's no there's no way the court could be wrong that my sons are two year, two grade levels behind their their peers in high school and quite possibly junior high and elementary school because of the court never being wrong. <laughs> now I know consequently mm -hmm, had a factual understanding of the proceeding yesterday. He did not have a subconscious, rational understanding, and he did not have the capacity to assist in his own defense. Yes. Yes. I had the evidence that I'd emailed uh, 2,000 email addresses on June 16th of 2017 that I was sitting in front of the Masonic Temple in Port Angeles, Washington. Yes. And I was at the senior center that afternoon emailing law enforcement. <laughs> Could have been similar to Matthew Shepard, where he was calling these different law enforcement agencies saying, these guys are trying to kill me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, well, he's a homosexual. That's what happens to him. <laughs> I do not have the capacity to assist in my own defense. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, I have no rational understanding that if I'm not in a city where there's an allegation of a crime, that there's no possible way I could be right that I didn't commit the crime. And if I email 2,000 email addresses and about 90% of them, yes, actually have the legal liability for the enforcement of the laws, mm -hmm, that they themselves couldn't be mm, participants in the malice mm, of the harassment and torture that killed a, a gay man. Yes. Now, I think... Oh, barriers to my competence, paranoid delusion, mm -hmm, which suggest detachment from reality and which will likely lead him to misinterpret the motivations of others. Mm -hmm including his attorney. <laughs> when Matthew Shepard made all those phone calls, and I don't think they had emails on back then, and he kept calling the FBI and the police department and the sheriff's departments, and it killed him. It's a mandatory 10 years in prison for hate crimes. Are you sure it's not a sexual orientation problem? Sure. Sister Department presenting what he considers evidence against his attorney's guidance? Uh-huh. Well, what evidence is there? Uh -huh. If I was here and I wasn't there, how could I be there? And if I was emailing 2,000 email addresses that my rights are being violated? Yes. How could it be considered cyber-stalking? So how the fuck is it right now?